good to see you all, and uh, glad that you could be here and with us on uh, the, the week before the Christmas Eve service, so that's good. Uh, we've been super excited about this series that we've been um, preaching called uh, Christmas Connections, and so we're drawing connections that might be a little bit deeper than you're used to uh, with the Christmas story and just going a little bit deeper. Week one, we talked about some of the prophetic uh, things that were mentioned hundreds of years before they were fulfilled in Jesus when Jesus came. And then Pastor Scott talked in the second week about dreams. And there's all these dreams that happen in the Christmas story. And uh, so, you know, therefore, we don't say dreams are ahead of Scripture, but dreams are part of our Christian uh, walk in life. And God will guide us with dreams and those kinds of things. And so it's okay to dream uh, big dreams that uh, your family will be saved or whatever it is that, um, that uh, you know, God puts on your heart. And then last week we talked about angels, which could be a little bit controversial, but angels are all over the Bible and specifically in the Christmas story so concentrated. And so it's like, are angels real? <laughs> and you're like, yeah, they're real. And there is an angelic realm and there is a spiritual realm beyond the realm that we're living in. And that's proved in Christmas, just a little bit deeper. And today, uh, like this guy, he went to his phone and said something about the Magi, and then was like, you want something about emojis? And I don't know if that happens to you on your cell phone, that happens to me all the time. I ask, you know, Siri something, and she is like way off. So I don't think they have the AI thing down just yet. Uh, there's some improvement required, but we're gonna talk about the Magi today. And uh, gonna be going through this a little bit differently than I usually do, because usually, you know, I'll start with a story and then ask a question, we go to the Bible. And really what I wanna do, I tried to kind of manipulate it into that, but really what I wanted to do today is just go through the scripture and just read, just read the scripture. And so to set that up before we go there, you know, the idea of the nativity, because the nativity's really taken a beating, hasn't it? So I apologize if you have like a beautiful nativity at your house. It's in your living room or in your dining room or it's on your front lawn or wherever it is. And because uh, they're like, oh, well, the shepherds, uh, this is not technically correct. And the wise men weren't there. And there wasn't just one angel. There was multitudes of angels. And, and so, you know, you can like people can have these beautiful nativity sets and they just take a beating at Christmas sometimes. That's not true. That's not the Bible. I'm not here to, you know, uh, pull apart the nativity or any of that kind of stuff because I think it just, it's, it's not a moment in historic time, but it captures all of the elements of the Christmas story. I still think Zachariah should be in there just saying. <laughs> Anyways, here we go. So, but the one part about the Magi specifically, because we know and we're going to talk about this, that the Magi weren't there on Christmas night, right? When Jesus was born, the Magi weren't there. The shepherds were there, and we know that from Luke 2. We read that. We talked about all the prophecy and all that kind of stuff, and there's a bunch of stuff. You guys were in our small group. Lots of great conversation about that. But then the Magi, somewhere between one to two years later, you heard that correctly, um, they arrive and they worship Jesus. They're looking for the Messiah, the one who's been born King of the Jews. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today. And so as much as I don't have an issue with nativities, just, just let them be what they are. Don't take your theology from it, but just enjoy it. Somebody's got a beautiful, oh, beautiful nativity. Just, just enjoy it, just go with it, right? But the thing is, it's about the Christmas plays. Put up your hand if you were in one of those Christmas pageants when you were a kid or saw them and you were like the wise men or Jesus or maybe a tree if you didn't have great acting skills. Um, but the one part about this that we're going to dial into here and we're going to talk about this, we're going to land on the journey in Jesus. And the one thing that we cannot adequately, adequately describe in a Christmas play is the journey the Magi took. Right? Because here's the way, because I've, I've done productions before, here's the way the productions happen in, in my world, right? They go, uh, oh, the magic. Okay, we got the Jesus, the shepherds are on there. We need the wise men to come. Oh, okay. Well, we'll have them come in the side door. No, no, no. It was a long journey. We'll have them come through the back door. <laughs> right? So instead of taking 15 steps, they got to take 32 steps. To get here well it was over 1100 kilometers so i'm not really sure we're getting the scope of this and so we're going to dial into this because we've got to make some connections today about christmas to understand what it was like and what kind of quest these guys were actually on it is mind-blowing i have 11 or 14 points 11 that'd be that'd be nice wouldn't it i have 14 points so we better get to it first scripture is matthew 2 and Matthew is a, a Jewish person, obviously, and he's writing 
his account of the Gospels to a Jewish audience. And that's really important to know because all of the Gospel writers write uh, from a different perspective to a different perspective. But he's a Jew writing to Jews to try to convince them that Jesus is the Messiah. So here it starts off, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi, wise men from the east, Persia, uh, came to Jerusalem. So these are 19 words in this little piece, and I have four points just in this verse alone. Um, number one, he is really dialogue. Well, this is even, this is a freebie. This is a bonus point. Uh, but he's, I just thought of that as I was reading it. So hey, that's good. Jesus is speaking through me even now. But, you know, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, he's talking about the Micah passage that says, well, where's he going to be born? He's going to refer to this, but he's saying it right up front. Okay, so point number one, um, it says that at this time, King Herod was the king in Jerusalem. He was the king of the Jews. And that's true. So now, if you send emissaries from one place, one ruling place to another, uh, and in this time, Jerusalem and Persia actually had a pretty good relationship going on. So scholars believe that this was sort of a diplomatic visit. That the kings from one side have to check in with the other king just to make sure everything is copacetic. So they came and they, they kind of land in Jerusalem. This was from the king of the Nabataeans who were in Persia at the time. Point one. Number two, and this is the part that a lot of people will miss. In fact, I think most of this we miss because we just read it like those Christmas pageants. And it's just like, should the wise men come through that door or that door? You know, and then they get there and it's like, okay, they're good. Um, the po second point is Matthew is a Jew and he's writing to a Jewish audience, and these people are as raw pagan as it gets. These people are pagan astrologers, and they show up in the Bible. This in uh, textual criticism is called the criteria of embarrassment. And what this does for this account is it gives so much credibility because if you were Matthew and you wanted to kind of sway a Jewish audience, you would not put this story in here. You would say, who came? Okay, well, that's not going in there. Because if it does, they'll be like, well, why did we put in the fact that these guys are coming? These guys aren't even us. Like, what? This doesn't make any sense at all. And you'll find that as Jesus goes through and becomes, begins to live his life, he fulfills all of the messianic prophecies, but yet all of the Jewish people are just in this conundrum. Is he the one? Right? You, you have that tension the whole time. And this is like, this is the story of Jesus. So right out of the gate, you got this whole criteria of embarrassment. Um, it brings so much authenticity. Because if you're Matthew, you don't bring this in unless this is a really, really significant point. These guys were pagan astrologers. And what's amazing about this is it was prophesied that when Jesus was born, when the Messiah came, that people from other lands would come and celebrate, um, would celebrate the Messiah. Psalm 72.10. It says, May the kings of Sheba and Seba present him gifts. May all kings... Bow down to him, and all nations serve him. Is, is that crazy or what? Right? Like, this has multiple fulfillments, because now all nations in the world, there are Christian people that do this, bring gifts, and all that kind of stuff. But this is specifically mentioning the, the kings of Sheba and Seba, which would be eastern kings, which would be representative from these guys. Point three. Here's the deal. It's 1,100 kilometers. So today, if we had to travel 1,100 kilometers... Well, that's, that's a long trip, isn't it? So you gotta get dropped by the 7-Eleven or the Max Milk and grab your pepperettes and we gotta get our water and we gotta, right? You need, your, you need your stuff. You can't have a road trip without snacks. Am I right? This is the first century. There's no cars, there's no GPS, there's no 7-Elevens, there's no hotels. There's nothing but desert, baby. And so when it says, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Again, we're just like, oh, is it that door or that door? Easy. Well, not for them it wasn't. For them, this was the journey of a lifetime. In fact, probably most of the people that came, if not all of them, were like, well, I've never been to Jerusalem. I've never been out of Persia before. And I've certainly never been across the entire desert 
maybe merchants, rare merchants. Like the world didn't move then like it does now. This is huge. This is huge. And when you read it and it's just one sentence, you're like, well, of course, I've read this before. Of course, the Magi. They're in the nativity. They're in the pageant. They're there. Yeah, okay. But how did they get there? Right? 1,100 kilometers. You know, like five kilometers walking speed of a camel, eight hours a day. I mean, how far does that get you? Right? 40 kilometers. Divide that into 1,100. And this is a journey of a lifetime. And then, I don't know if you've ever been on a road trip with high maintenance people. <laughs> and I'm going to... I did, I, did, I did look over here, but... I, I was looking at Tony. I wasn't looking at you. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm hungry. I'm stuck. This is boring. When are we going to get there? Right? Like, this is... Like... These are real people, man. And... and you know, as much as there would have need to be tents for sleeping and cooking tents and horses and camels, soldiers, it wasn't safe to travel back then. This was a massive entourage that was moving through the desert. Not three kings like we see in the Christmas cards, probably like 40 to 50 people. It was like a small village that was moving across the desert at a snail's pace with everybody having to go to the bathroom every five minutes. Just go, it's the desert, nobody cares. But everybody can see me. That was, that was not. <laughs> the other part of this is that it was weeks, maybe months of preparation. Right? So, sorry, Steve. Uh, weeks or months of preparations to uh, gather together the tents and the, the resources. We need the food. We need the cooking stuff. We need, oh, and are you coming? Are you coming? Well, I can't make it because I got to be at another meeting. And, what, you know, and so it, like all the schedules had to be aligned and we had to have all the supplies. And then they had to get cobbled together the gold. Well, how much gold do we give to a king? I'm not really sure, but no, we probably need a little bit more. Oh, well, do you got any myrrh? No, I'm fresh out. Well, go to the next town and get the myrrh because we need the myrrh. How long did all that take? You don't just drop in. Oh, we, we were in the neighborhood. We thought we'd stop by. Yeah, 1,100 kilometers. No, even today, if you were going to drive to Sudbury or whatever it is, you've got to be okay, okay, we've got enough gas, do we need this, we've got enough water, and separates, yeah. And the fact, again, that it can't be overstated that these were not Jewish people going, our king was born, let's go celebrate. These are people that go, we see this star, what is this? I think it means a king is born. Is it our king? If it's not our king, then why do we care? Why would we pay homage to somebody else's king? But we're gonna do, go to all this work, make all these pre preparations, you know, winnow down the list of people who are actually going, bring these costly gifts, make sure that there's soldiers and security and all that stuff, and then we're gonna make this 1,100 kilometer trip through the desert for months and months on end, where everybody's on everybody's last nerve. For somebody else's king? That doesn't make any sense. None of this makes any sense whatsoever. So why would they do this? And this is the part that blew me away. And when I was thinking about this whole series, I wanted to get to this point here. Because we just studied the book of Daniel. Right? We just came through a 14-week study of the book of Daniel. And where did Daniel go? Babylon. To Babylon. And where is Babylon the capital city of? Persia. Interesting. Okay. Well, uh, Daniel 9 tells us with incredible accuracy the year that the Messiah would be born. Mind-blowing stuff. So check this out in Daniel 9.25. So this is the Christmas connection at a deeper level. No one understand this. From the time the word goes up to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, remember it had been destroyed and was in ruins, until the anointed one, the first time in the Bible that the Messiah is mentioned. Mashiach Nagid is the, is the Hebrew. And this is the Savior, the one that will save everybody from their sins. First time it's mentioned. And it gives, it gives a bit of a, a, a formula here. The, until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens. Or these are, are weeks of sevens. And 62 sevens. So 49 plus 434, even I can do that math. 483. So from that date, when the, uh, when the uh, decree 
was made until the anointed one would come would be 483 years. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. And we all know that, the, that right, this all happened. This is all, we, again, we go through Daniel and then Ezra, Nehemiah. If you read those scriptures, you will read all of the decrees that happened and when they happened. And so these astrologers, for whatever reason, and we'll read about the reason in just a second, were anticipating a king would be born. In and around this time, they're like, okay, well, we're at, you know, what are we at? You know, 482, 481, we better be watching. Right? So check this out. And this, this just blows my mind, because it's almost 500 years later. Daniel 2, 48, it says... Well, and a little background. So you remember in Daniel, if you remember the story, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has this wild dream of all these beasts, or actually it's a, sta it's a statue. Daniel has a similar uh, dream later on in the book, but it's this statue, and he has this dream, but he goes to his wise men, his astrologers, and he says, hey, you guys need to interpret a dream for me. And they're like, okay, sure, lay it on us. Tell us what it is, and we'll interpret it for you. He's like, no, 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 not so fast. You need to tell me what I dreamed, which is impossible, you need to tell me what I dreamed and then give me the interpretation for it. And they're like, uh, sir, that's impossible. Nobody can do that. Right? And so enter Daniel because everybody's going to get their heads are going to get chopped off. And so Daniel steps into the moment and goes, well, can, can I give it a shot? Just give me 24 hours. He goes home and he prays with his three buddies. And all of a sudden God reveals to them the dream. Again, impossible. Even the magistrates there say only God could do this. And so Daniel shows up and he's like 17, 18 years old. And he's like standing before this king and his, his life is on the line. And he says, okay, king, this is what you dream. Bang, 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 bang. And this is what it means. Bang, 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 bang. And the king's jaw drops to his chest and goes, only God could have revealed this. You know why? Because God was in that moment setting up Christmas. Why? Because of this verse. Then the, king's, uh, then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him, and he made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, a.k.a. Persia, and placed him in charge of all its... So you got this Jewish kid who knows the laws of God, and we, rep we see him reading the laws of God, and then what ends up happening is he starts to download all of God's promises from before to all of the wise men in Persia. To the point where he's going like, there's a savior coming. There's one that's going to save us all from our sin. And so generation from generation to generation, because back then you always took your father's job, right? So what they believe is that these astrologers passed this information down from generation to generation. All of his Daniel 9 stuff, all of his Daniel 7 stuff. They knew it all. And the Jewish people didn't. Is that crazy or what? And so now you have these magi, these wise men traveling 1,100 kilometers when they see a star. It gets even better because I'm going to tell you when, this, when the prophecy for the star happens. But Daniel, you can see this connection. Like You're like, well, how did they know? How did they know to go to Jerusalem? Well, it's, if you make that connection, all of a sudden you know that they were sitting there and Daniel was saying, well, we know. We know that the world is going to be saved, and it's going to be saved through this guy. Here's the time. I was given a vision. Here's the time. All this stuff. He totally lays it all out for them. He trusts all those Isaiah prophecies, the Jeremiah prophecies, prophecies in Psalms, all of those things, until they saw the day, until they, the day they saw the star appear. And when they saw it, can you imagine? Like, oh my goodness, he was right. Daniel 9, 24, do we have that one? No. So 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. So this was what Daniel was telling these guys that this is gonna happen. Some of these things are yet to happen, but some of these things were fulfilled when Jesus came. Let's go to verse two and see what's in there. Number two, it says, well, if we go back, it says, And Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the time of King Herod. Magi, or wise men from the east, Persia, a.k.a. Babylon, came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? 
What a direct question. Nobody even in Jerusalem would have known, like, what? What king of the Jews? This doesn't, they didn't even understand the question, let alone expect that there was an answer coming. Uh, we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Like, I don't know about you, but I'm like, I'm two verses in and I'm undone. I'm like, are you kidding? Like, just piecing all this together. You're like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? These guys have been waiting 500 years. And then after they, they were actually watching, they saw the star. And then they're going to make all these preparations. And then they're going to make the trip. And then they're going to go to the king, as diplomatic notions would, would suggest. And they're going to ask this question. Okay, where's the king? And they're all sitting there going, what are you talking about? We know they brought their wives. This is Phil. We know they brought their wives because they asked for directions. <laughs> right? I, I've been waiting for that one all week. I'm like, yeah. Like, where is the one? But like, no, I'm fine. I know exactly where we're going. Like, no. So the wives were there. We know this. This is a big entourage. But seriously, the star prophecy, how do we know this? Numbers 27, 24, 17. So this is what Daniel was telling the Magi and that was passed down. Numbers 24, 17. He says, this is Balaam, who was a prophet of Israel back way back in the day. I see him, but not now, speaking of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. So like the Jews should have known Man, they should have been watching, and they weren't. And it took pagan astrologers to kind of go, hey, your scripture says there's going to be a star, and there was one, and we've come, and where is this guy? He's apparently going to save the world from its sin. And they're like, we don't have a clue. We don't even know. Point six, point seven is... Matthew said they, uh, Matthew never said they followed the star. And this is the part that blows my mind. Uh, if you'll notice, it says that a star, we saw his star when it rose. And then after they get directions to go to Bethlehem, then they see the star again over his house. So this whole notion that they followed a star isn't true. Because the constellations happened, burst in the sky, and they're like, oh, he came. Okay. And then now they... When, and there's this thought that it's kind of like the children of Israel, right? Pillar of uh, cloud by day, fire by night. Okay, this is the way we go. Wasn't like that. Star rose, they left, and they walked by faith for 1,100 kilometers. By faith. And hit Jerusalem. Like, I don't know about you, but I get chills. Because, like, if Jesus doesn't show me all the steps, I'm not taking the first one. And they're like, we're going to go 1,100 kilometers by faith because we saw what God said he promised to us. And for those of us in our, in our faith, we need to take this as some courage, right? That we need to walk by faith and not by sight. It's so important. So Isaiah uh, 63, it says, Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Like there. Is your mind blown yet? Like, God, it's just so humbling how God ties all this together. Over centuries, millennia, pagan astrologers, Daniel and Babylon and Jerusalem being destroyed and all of these planning Christmas the whole time. It's unbelievable. So let's go to the, the text again. And it says, when, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed. You would be, right? A, you probably should have known this was coming because you're probably not concentrating on the right stuff. B, did you mention another king is coming? What does that mean for my kingdom and my kingship? So I love this though as well. It says, and all Jerusalem with him. So the king was disturbed. But obviously, if an entourage of 50 people show up in your town of, you know, 50,000 or whatever, it's like, did you see all those people come in? What are they doing here? They're not from around here, are they? Why are they here? Like, are they going to, like, right? That would have been, that would have been absolutely daunting. When he had called together all the people, 
all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied. Because I'm not sure they were even privy to the question, but he's asking this question to kind of like, maybe he goes aside and says, hey guys, like, where's this guy supposed to be born? Because I got to tell these guys, right? He didn't know they were asking about the king of the Jews. Um, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, or Bethlehem Ephrathah, remember, there were two Bethlehems, right? There were two Bethlehems. There's one in the north and one in the south, and it was the one in the south. Uh, you, uh, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least of the rulers in Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So all of a sudden, for Aaron, he was probably disturbed before, and now it probably moved into, like, I'm a little bit terrified here. Like, wait, what? So this is a true thing that these guys, they tell me this cockamamie story that they saw a star and now they're here on our front door. I don't know anything. So you're telling me this is actually in the Bible. And then we read that a couple of weeks ago in Micah 5, 2, where he's literally quoting this scripture. And what's amazing about this is that Daniel would not have been able to give them this information. Why? Because Micah was written after Daniel. Right? So he tells them the number stuff. He tells them all the Isaiah stuff. He tells them because he has those scrolls. But Micah's not going to be written for another 100 years or 200 years. And this idea that there's two Bethlehems, one in the north and one in Judea in the south, the distinction is so important. So then verse 7, it says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared past tense so we know that they didn't follow the star and also we also know that they knew the exact time they were watching they were waiting and they documented okay well this is the exact time when because remember daniel told them 483 years it's gonna happen and so he sent them to bethlehem and said go search carefully for the child and as soon as you find him report to me so that i too may go and worship him yeah right um that's in the message if you read the message it's like yeah right in brackets i tell it after the, sorry, it's not. Don't go to uh, after they had heard this, the king went on their, the king's, sorry, after they had heard the king, so the, after the meeting, uh, they went on their way, and the, and the star that they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was, and when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Confirmation. Confirmation. Can you imagine? You're on this wild goose chase, 1,100 kilometers all the pee breaks, all the pepperettes, all the stuff that you had to put up with along the way. You go to, you finally get this information from the king, and then you go to this place, and you're like, okay, well now, we, now what do we got? Star. Bang. What started the whole thing is the thing that confirms it all at the end. And then, again, you know, this is so, this is such a, a trope of the Christmas story that we miss it. We miss the fact that these magi have traveled 1,100 kilometers to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world. And so on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him, like we read in Psalm 72. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So a, a huge point here that we need to just take in is it's not a baby. The word that Luke uses in Luke 2 is the word infant, right? In the Greek, it's an infant baby. But in Matthew, it's talking about a toddler. So this is not a, an infant. So some time has passed, and that's the time that it takes for the Magi to get to visit. But then the gifts seem like three random gifts, don't they? And for us, of course, we know it. It's part of our lore. It's the part of the, well, we need three wise men because there's three gifts and you can't have one guy holding two things and going, why do I get that to hold the two things? Like, why doesn't he hold the, let's just put three in there and there'll be no fighting with the wise men. But Frank and gold, frankincense, and myrrh. You know, and this is all very specific. Why? Because they had talked to Daniel. And check this out. This, this is mind-blowing. Obviously, gold they brought. Gold would have been the order of the day. If you're going to bring anything of the highest quality for the highest level person, you would bring gold. This is the gift for a king. This is a gift of exaltation. This is a gift of worship. And so we're coming to you from another land. We're recognizing that you're the king. We're going to bring you this gift of gold because it symbolizes that you are a king. And we know that God, Jesus is the king of kings. 
the frankincense. It was a, a, a resin. And uh, this is the high priestly office gift that's representing of the high priestly, um, the high priestly office. Uh, incense is very much connected to spirituality. And back then, it was very much connected to spirituality. In fact, they burned incense in the temple. And so this was the idea that Jesus is going to be a spiritual leader. That he's going to be the high priest of all high priests. It was the way the Jewish worshiper would, would worship at the time. It was suggesting, implying that he would be the leader, their spiritual leader. But then the myrrh. But then the myrrh. Uh, this is the most obscure gift of them all. Because the king of the gold we get, thank you so much. I like it when you come over 1,100 kilometers and give me gold. Yeah, that's great. I'll put this in the bank. That's great. Oh, and this smelly stuff? That's awesome too, because I love my house to smell nice. I love to worship the Lord. The myrrh is the one that's kind of like, why did you bring this? Myrrh is the gift that represents the fact that he's going to die. This is the death spice. This is what they would embalm bodies with because the stench would be so bad that they would embalm bodies with myrrh, another resin, to, um, to make sure that they didn't, they didn't stink. It was a preserved that way. But get this, it was anointing not just for death but also for service. Super costly, super bitter smell. So, I mean, I don't know if you've had a baby. I actually, we got some baby stuff happening here today, right? Uh, and we're, grandkids are landing tomorrow at six o'clock. Thanks for asking. <laughs> but if you're going to a baby shower, you bring the diapers, you get the crib, you get the stroller, you get the car seat, you get all the stuff. But if you were ever to bring a casket to a baby funeral, you probably would not get invited to the next shower, right? Like even if it was like worth a lot, which this was. This was so over the line. Bring thanks, thanks for bringing the death ointment for my baby. Like how do you write that card, right? Oh my goodness. Now check this out in Daniel 9:26. They knew this. They knew. He's going to be a king. He's going to be a priest. And he's going to die for our sins. In Daniel 9.26. That we've just been reading about. It says. The anointed one. Will be put to death. And will have nothing. So these kings. Not only saw the star. And made the trip. And honored him as the king. And the savior of the world. And their spiritual leader. But they went to the point of going, we know he's also going to die for our sins because Daniel told us this. And so here is this most obscure gift that nobody would ever give to a baby and we're giving it to him because we know the purpose that he has for our life. Like, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I just, I just, I just start to weep because God knows all this. Like, what kind of God do we have when literally as orbits are going around and we know and from you know James Webb telescope and Hubble telescope and all the you know study we've done in the last recent years that there are planets that are circling around planets and there's you know constellations in the sky that kind of move and shift and all these things happen and somehow in God's economy God tells Daniel oh by the way XYZ is going to happen uh, you know in 483 years and the stars are literally going to align because I caused that so that I can tell you that I'm sending a savior so that three pagan astrologers can notice and then go and confirm that this is the one who is going to save our people from our sins. Like, what kind of God do we have? You know, some people like question, well, is God really omnipotent because he didn't heal my cat with when the tail, and they had to cut the tail off. <laughs> well, God was maybe busy making the cosmos, you know, uh, come into line with what he wants for his plan and his purpose. Maybe he's got some bigger fish to fry, you know what I'm saying? Sorry about your cat. Tail. <laughs> so, and then in so true God fashion, verse 12, it says, And having been warned in the dream 
not to go back to Herod. They returned to their country by another route. Which says to me, if you truly encounter Jesus in a worshipful experience, that you do not leave the same way you came. When you encounter Jesus, the reality and the truth, the, the truth of who Jesus is, you don't leave the same. And I don't know, that's like just a weird detail to have in there, right? And being warned in a dream, don't go that way. Because you know, he's got some bad intentions. And then, of course, we know the next man. And also, Joseph, you need to get out of Dodge too, because he's coming for you, and he's coming for your baby. So, you know, we gotta, we got to close. But, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I'm moved to tears as I just look a little deeper, right, into these pagan astrologers that just show up, that they're in our nativities, they're in our Christmas plays. And it's like, okay, well, yeah, they've always been there. But when you go a little bit deeper, you're kind of like, this is really significant stuff. Like, this is really important to the credibility and to the uh, authenticity, the veracity of the story and what Jesus actually did for us at Christmas. Like, God blows my mind. And what we talked about at small group a little bit, we even talked about a lot of this stuff at small group on Thursday. You know, as we look through and we talked about the first week of prophecy and the second week of dreams and the third week of angels and then this fourth week where it talks about pagan astrologers and you got the cosmos involved and you got pagans involved and you got dreams involved and you got spiritual dimensions involved with all the angels and you got all these prophecies happening with all these people throughout all time. You're just like, God involved everybody. Shepherds are in, Zachariah, you're in, everybody. And it just goes to show that there was this all-inclusiveness to the Christmas story. From the cosmos to the angels to working with dreams to pagan Gentile people to shepherd, lowly shepherds, blue collar dudes to Mary and Joseph who was like, well, they didn't rate. They're just ordinary people as well. And you're going to have the Christ child. You know, it's a story for us. It's a story for us. And so as we close, what's, what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway? Well, I'm glad you asked. I was going to make a, uh, a joke about you know, like you need the pep rats, you need the water, you need all the stuff, right, to go on the road trip, but you also need a playlist, right? Now you can't go, like my daughter, right? She'd be like, oh my God, I'm on the Spotify, am I, you know, am I connected? Because we're gonna listen to Taylor Swift the whole time. And, you know, and, and that's when I text you guys, pray for me, I'm listening to Taylor Swift. You know, so I was thinking about, you know, the proclaimers, you know, I would walk 500 miles and I would walk 500, right? Come on, Camel, let's go, keep going. Right? You know, and uh, I was thinking about Neil Young, Heart of Gold, right? I'm keep me searching for Heart of Gold. And then I, I linked on to YouTube. Still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I just, this year I read Bono's biography. And I, I thought, well, that's, odd. that's an odd title for a, a guy who's found faith in Jesus, isn't it? And so in the biography he has a chapter entitled, Still haven't found what I'm looking for. And they go, you know, and he even says, you know, some people would question this and go, well, didn't you find the truth? He said, you never arrive. You never arrive. The life in Jesus is a constant quest. It's a constant learning. It's a constant understanding. It's a constant growing. It's constant motion. You're always running from something, right, in your quest, or you're running to truth. And although you might find it, there's still work to be done. There's still a road ahead. And things that God wants you to do in your quest to serve Him and honor Him. It made me think of the old book, Pilgrim's Progress. Have you guys read that book? Yeah. Like at one time in the world, this was the, next to the Bible, this was the um, most read book in the entire world. Most published, most purchased, all that stuff. And the, the Pilgrim's Progress was written in 1678. It's an allegorical story uh, where the main character, whose name is Christian, uh, gets this book and he reads about leaving the city of destruction and finding his way into the celestial city, right? From darkness to light. He reads this book and he finds out and he sets out on this journey to salvation and he encounters all of these characters along the way. There's the character of family, which he has to leave to go on his quest. 
He finds evangelist. He finds obstinate. He finds pliable. He finds he comes across a swamp. Uh, he finds a name a man named Help. He finds world the worldly wise men. He finds legality. He finds faithful, helpful, and mercy. He finds all of these people along the way. And the reason why this book resonates because that's us, isn't it? We're all on a journey. And we're all searching. And I pray that God has shown you his star and that you're in process and you're working your way toward his star. But that's not the end of the story. It's not like, okay, well, we arrived. We gave him the gifts and that's it. It's about the quest and not about the arrival. The race is not done just yet. And as I look at the incredible fabric, just the quilting together of all of this that is just in 12 chapters of scripture. I'm just humbled and amazed that that's the God that I get to pursue, right? That's the God that's gonna meet me on the way when I hit the swamp, when I hit the obstacle, when I hit the bump in the road, right? When it's easy, when it's tough, God be with me, I need you in this moment. And I'm going to run the race until the race is done. Amen. And let's, let's pray together. Father, we thank you.